Okay. Felt a little bit standing up there like the NFL pregame, NFL on Fox pregame. <laughs> yeah, sure. Right. Um, thank you for that introduction. Uh, thank you to this museum. I'm supposed to be a jaded New Yorker who's not uh, awed by things, but um, this place is awesome. So anyone who's um, maybe watching this online, uh, whether you live in Chicago or not, I would urge you to make it your business to, to get here. Um, second, a big thanks to, uh, to Chris and Ivan, of course, for being here, uh, to Library of America, uh, in my view, the best publisher in the country, and I strongly encourage you to um, seek out their, uh, their, all of their books. And a big thank you to all of you. Uh, I know there are a lot of things that contend for your time every, every night, so we appreciate you being here. Um, and I'm glad that you covered a lot of the, that history and statistics uh, to do with peanuts, because there's an awful lot of it. Um, it uh, I sort of want to get into this um, uh, as sort of a gateway by asking, you know, there's a, there's a, it begs the question, are we in a new Peanuts moment? Because um, as of November 1st, Apple TV started uh, a new Peanuts show, Snoopy in Space. Um, at the Thanksgiving Day Parade uh, later this month in New York, there's going to be a new Snoopy float. Uh, come the beginning of the new year, there's going to be a new national tour of your good man, Charlie Brown, which I only learned in the process of putting this book together is the most produced musical in American history. And if you had to guess the number of productions, I'm going to guess you couldn't even come close to guessing that it's 40,000 uh, that is employed, if that's the right word, about 250,000 uh, people. I still have never seen it. <laughs> <laughs> that's a big admission. I feel bad. So um, we have a lot to cover, but I just want to throw this out to you guys first. Um, you know, is this, is this a new moment? What, Chris, in your piece, you talk about sort of it's not a coincidence that maybe Fred Rogers and, and Charles Schultz are having sort of a renaissance, but has it just been sort of one 70 year love affair with Peanuts, or is there something that's contributing now that's engendering kind of a new um, affection and attention for it? I want to hear both of you guys on that. Well, I think in my own case, and probably pretty much everybody in this room, it's been a perpetual Peanuts moment for our entire lives because Charles Schultz created these characters that are alive in our minds, even though he died 20 years ago. I mean, I still think about them, I think, pretty much every day. And I mean, granted, I'm a cartoonist, so there's, I've already got something wrong with me, but um, I think everybody in this room, with the exception of this nice girl, Elizabeth, over here, who was born after Charles Schultz's death, but is obviously very uh, inclined to the character. She brought Snoopy and Charlie Brown with her and is wearing a Lucy dress, which is great to see there's that's Schultz is communicating something to to people who weren't even born yet when when he um which is pretty incredible actually which is the real test of art so I'm going to start some images here so you don't have to look at my head the whole time you've got two other heads to choose from but then you'll have some pictures too so well I was yeah I was just uh to second that um I'm, I'm not really that much aware of what's going on so I didn't know if there was a moment, uh, as you said, basically that's been my entire life. It, uh, Charles Schultz was the biggest influence on everything I do as a cartoonist. So I, I, he's in my bloodstream at this point, you know, so I can't conceive of a world without it. But uh, it's great to hear that in the outside of my reality, or what you guys call reality, um, outside of my head, that there is a, a resurgence happening. I, I, I want to mention that the two of these, you know, put these programs together and sometimes the chemistry is just not there because the people don't know each other or it just doesn't jive. I only learned after the fact that you two guys not only know each other but ha have had dinner together every Sunday night faithfully for the last 20 years. Yeah. It's true actually, yeah. Even from, uh, I, I actually was trying to remember the night, the, the Sunday that would have corresponded with, with the death of Schultz. We must, that must have been the number one topic across the burrito table that <laughs> night, but I actually don't remember it at all. Do you remember it? Um, no, well, the, again, this has been a continuous stream of these Sunday dinners, so it's, it's hard to even put things in the timeline, but all I know is that you've seen so much taco sauce on my shirt over the years, I could probably make a mound this high on the <laughs> table, so. Yeah. Well, it's funny, if it's been 20 years, that makes it 1999, which mm -hmm. happens to have been the year that 
uh, I got to meet Schultz, which um, I knew it was a special surreal thing that was happening at the time, but I didn't realize just how much so. And the back, quick backstory there is uh, I'm a literary agent. I represent other writers and their books generally. And uh, a guy I worked with, Bob Blauner, actually no relation, was putting together his own anthology about uh, men writing essays about the death of their mothers and the grief of men. It's called Our Mother's Spirits. And right around that time, I saw Schultz on a uh, A&E biography. Um, you know, and he was sort of, not notoriously, but sort of famously stoic and, and uh, kind of not outwardly emotional. But when he got on the subject of talking about his mom, um, it was deep and it was heavy and it was profound and it engendered something for me to want to write to him on Bob's behalf just to see if there was any chance he'd consider contributing to that book. And I thought at best I'd get back a, 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 for, a nice form letter. It was before the internet, at least it was for me. And instead, I get a note saying, declining as politely as possible the invitation to write for that other book, but saying, if you ever find yourself in Santa Rosa, California, stop by. I'd love to meet. And I thought, if that's a bluff, I'm calling it. <laughs> uh, I happen to have a little redhead, redheaded girlfriend at the, at the time. And I said, how would you feel about planning a trip to Napa Valley and going out to the so there it was in his office, and wow, he could not have been kinder, more generous, uh, thoughtful, sensitive. And this book is an anthology, and I, I, along the way I looked up the word anthology comes from a Latin word, I think, meaning bouquet. So this book really is a, a bouquet to, to Charles Schultz and the world and the characters he created. Um, but about these two guys, um, not only have they been having dinner every Sunday night for 20 years, their, their two pieces that are in this book were published as excerpts in arguably the two most august literary publications in the country, if not the world, uh, Chris's by the New Yorker and Ivan's by the Paris Review. Um, and there's just a clear, palpable, mutual admiration between you guys. Uh, and one of the things, I, I'd read each of your pieces multiple times uh, during the process of this book coming together, but it was only very recently I read them back to back. And what came through sort of um, palpably and concretely was, were, were two things. One, how much in general, um, what, a, what a, a shared sensibility you have and what a, a very clear, strong sense you have, not just of your own gratitude to Charles Schultz, but, but a sense that all cartoonists and maybe beyond that um, should have toward Schultz. And the second thing, was how much you both identified very strongly with Charlie Brown. So I wonder if you could talk about, take your pick of either of those things. You want to go first? Um, it, it, it would be impossible to explain it. I know just the, from the first time I read Peanuts, which I must have been eight or nine years old, I, that's when I came to America from Italy. And that was one of the first American comics that I read. I actually was not familiar with Peanuts before that, but. I just instantly connected with Charlie Brown. I guess I was picked on a lot at school, but I had this uh, completely uh, unwarranted or unearned kind of optimism about things that Charlie Brown has. He kind of can still delude himself and have that hope. But I, I think I connected with that uh, because you don't, when you're a kid getting picked on, you don't want to really accept that reality that you're at the the bottom of the social order, you know. So I, I just uh, really connected with the character and his outlook on things, which is pessimistic, but kind of weirdly optimistic at times. In my own case, I, as I said in my essay, I, uh, I was so moved and upset by the fact that Charlie Brown never got any Valentines that I uh, wrote, I made him a Valentine, and I told my mom to send it to him. And, um, that I felt like I had an in because my mom was a newspaper editor and my grandfather was actually the editor of the paper, the managing editor of the paper before that. So I thought, he's going to get it. He's definitely going to get it. Um, it turns out Chip told me, Chip Kidd, who, uh, who did the cover for the book and has done two different books on Peanuts, he said, oh yeah, thousands of kids sent Schultz um, Valentine's to Charlie Brown. So I should say they sent Charlie Brown Valentine's because I, you know, I knew that I was sending a Valentine to a drawing, but I still knew somehow that it was going to make me feel better if I did because there was something every time I saw that 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 Charlie Brown wasn't going to get 
a Valentine, it made me feel horrible, and I just wanted to make myself and hopefully him feel better. So Schultz really has a, had a power in his drawing and his ability to get right into the, the human heart, I think, better than any other cartoonist. So. And he's passed that down to our generation. So I don't think graphic novels would be what they are now. Like what we're, we try to do in longer books would not exist without Schultz figuring out a way of getting it into a character on the page and then having it come back out into the reader's mind and circle through the heart that way. Um, Ivan, your piece is, is called Yesterday Will Get Better. Right. Yes. <laughs> can you can you maybe just explain that title a little bit or contextualize that? Um, I, I must have gotten that from a strip, but I just uh, it's stuck in my head. I was looking for things to connect to it, and um, I guess that's kind of my philosophy of life too, because I ruminate a lot. So, um, but I keep thinking that somehow it that's going to change the past. Actually, I think we're all doing that as cartoonists <laughs> by drawing about it. You're sort of uh, it's not just reliving it, and I think that was part of uh, Schultz's genius too. That he was in the moment of like whatever he was drawing, based on his memory of childhood or whatever was going on, he could kind of relive it as he's drawing it, and it's so uh, vivid and real. It really does jump off the page. Um, but I think we're all, uh, maybe not every cartoonist, but it feels like kind of that's what we're doing is revisiting this past and maybe changing it or overcoming it or whatever, however you want to look at it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, Schultz clearly, when you find out after reading David Michaelis's biography, you realize that, like all of the details of the strip are based on Schultz's life. Like he worked with a, with a Linus Maurer at the art instruction schools. He worked with somebody named Charlie Brown at the art instruction schools. There was a preacher named Charlie E. Brown, Charles E. Brown. He had a friend when he was a kid named Charlie E. Brown, I believe. Um, and it runs through his strips so personally that sitting at that table every day of his life, he was going over these slights and wrongs that he felt that he'd experienced as a kid and trying somehow to make them make them right, I think. And I, I mean, I certainly identify with that. I know Ivan identifies with it. We talk about it all the time. I, the younger cartoonists don't as much, and it really makes me mad, and they're so well-adjusted. I don't know, like, <laughs> even my daughter, she's 14 years old, and she's so happy and well-adjusted. My wife said the other night, she's like, how, how this isn't fair, you know? Like, wait, how, how did she get to be so happy? When I was 14, I was miserable, so. Well, it's funny, uh, picking up on that point, we, you did an event for the, at the New Yorker Festival uh, a few weeks back, and the question, uh, to do with this project, and the question came up of whether Peanuts is quote unquote dark, mm -hmm. and, and not to put words in your mouth, but I think you're kind of, it's not mutually exclusive, but I think you, your focus was more that it was real. Is that accurate? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I read it, when I read it, I felt like these, this represent, not only were the events real and honest, it felt like life. It felt like the indignities and the uncertainties and the sort of violence really that life can inflict on you felt honest to me in a way that other things on television didn't. And on top of that, the characters especially, that's the most important part. They feel more real almost than than the, than real people. Like they existed for me when I opened up those paperbacks and dove into them, those little drawings came alive to me in a way and they were my friends. And I, I know that Clifford Thompson said the same thing. It's just, and I think everybody in this room probably feels the same way a little bit more or less. Like you read Peanuts and you had that feeling like, yeah, these, these people, these little, little figures on the page are, are real, so. They're real and would you say, I mean, you use the word that the, uh, the genius, you said that you write that the genius of Peanuts is that it seems simple and uh, replicable. Yeah, I mean, uh, I thought that when I was uh, younger, like I could copy this because there's just a few lines. Um, there's um, often not even like a, a lot of backgrounds to draw. It's very, it feels like it's minimal until you really try to copy it. And there's some, it really is like, for, it's beyond forging somebody's handwriting. Um, you know, because you also, it's not just the visual look of it, but the totality of it together. I think it's impossible. You'd, you'd have to be Charles Schultz to do it. I think that's part of the genius of it. No one else could do that. 
Is that genius and also for people who do what you, it, was it also frustrating because it seems so accessible and doable? I mean, I think there are people, the last book I did put together was about the Beatles and I think a lot of people grew up thinking, I could play the chords and hit the notes and then you try and you just, especially when it's John and Paul harmonizing, it sounds like one voice and you're trying to make your one, your voice sound like two. But in this case, was it, was it actually frustrating or? or and it was just humbling, you know, humbling. but, uh, but it, it just helped me appreciate it even more. I knew I liked it, but then um, I, th I think, um, maybe I read things in the past with uh, some cartoonists, not belittling Schultz, but kind of talking about, oh, it's really simple or, mm -hmm. I just think there's more to it, and it's not so easy to not even replicate it visually, but there's more to cartooning than just the surface of it. And um, I don't know. Well, like his lines, like you've said, even I think you quoted this about him drawing Linus and how the pen splays out. Like it's a record of the way his hand moves, and the way his hand not only moves, but the way his hand is connected to his mind and to his heart and to his eyes and how that hand and all of those things changed in 50 years. Like you look at Charlie Brown in 1950, it's, he's completely unrecognizable if you put it next to the Charlie Brown of 1999. But they, if you watch him slowly change, it makes sense. But still, it's the same thing that was in Schultz that he transmogrified onto that page that then you feel. You see it with your eye and you feel that drawing in a way that I don't really think there's any other medium where we're asked to read a picture other than comics. And Schultz was by far the most literate of picture makers I, I think there ever has been, so. Well, that's interesting too, because I've heard you talk a little bit about this the trajectory of Charlie Brown and, and, and uh, some historians think that at the turning point, maybe some think for better or for worse, for the whole strip for the 50 years was when Schultz put Snoopy up on two feet and stopped having him just be a dog crawling around on all fours. Um, but do we see that in, in the other characters as well? You mean when they... Like, that, that, that there's been, that there was a, a big change, the way you're talking about that Charlie Brown in those 50 years, I mean, with Linus and Lucy, I mean, do we see... I mean, cause yeah. we were you, you both talk about how there's no, there's, time doesn't change in the strip, like that, that they don't get older it is, and they're... It is strange, uh, like uh, Chris was saying, um, thinking about Charlie Brown in 1950 and in 1999, if you see them right next to each other, they're such such different drawings, but it's almost like looking at a baby picture of yourself and then a pic, like, you know, picture of somebody that's 50 or older or whatever, but you can still see that it's the same person, and that's kind of amazing. I don't think the characters aged very much in the strip, but it's almost like they, they did age on like some other level, you know? It's like Sally, Linus, and Lucy aged. Lucy started out as a Fresh little baby. And Schultz and little didn't little know what to do with her, but the second that she, at least according to David Michaelis, became a stand-in for his wife, then she like <laughs> lit up on the page. She started dominating the strip, and then you know he could really pour himself into it. So, I think I mean Charlie Brown for the first couple of years of the strip was almost sort of a weird. I'm just, you you mentioned optimism, but I think he was sort of like a. Not a morose character, certainly the way he became. And then later in the strip, he became almost sort of a cipher, almost kind of a quiet, somber character, kind of like a, I don't, I wouldn't even know how to describe him, but he did, except with the football and kite. Um, oh boy, sorry, it's probably my wife. She always calls me when I'm. Schultz's ghost. Sorry. Yeah. Um, um, he became more just kind of calm or something, I think, maybe. I don't know. I think that's more of like an older, older cartoonist thing, so. The strip, and I think Schultz even said later, he said, I did things in the 1950s that I would never do now. Like, he felt that it was way too spiteful, way too angry, way too violent, and of course, that's why it's so exciting to read, because it's, you know, the emotional violence on the page is just so, you know, like, wow, you can't believe he's saying that, but it still, at the same time, feels so innocent and warm, strange. I mean, it's an, you raise a point, 1950 versus 2000 versus today, I mean, the culture of society is so much more polarized now. I mean, it, to me, it begs the other question of, well, number one, how do you really explain the transcendence, the universal appeal over such a long period of time? And two, could such a thing happen today, or does it exist in any way, shape, or form in the culture? Well, you can 
you can handle that one. Uh, <laughs> thanks a lot. Yeah, I and probably maybe it does somewhere. I mean, you mentioned earlier Fred Rogers, and I really feel like Schultz and Rogers were sort of similar people in a way. And in this moment now, where we're we've got not only a bullying president, but we've got a bullying media, the internet. There's no, that's what the internet is, it's just a giant four-dimensional bully. It takes everything and converts it to the absolute black or white ends of the spectrum and allows for no humanity to come into it, even though, of course, all of the software developers who created it told us, like, oh, it's gonna bring people together. You know, the opposite thing seems to be happening. So I think that Schultz and Fred Rogers especially were, they were men who, who, who were, they, they provided an example of how to be a man who's not a jerk and how to be a good father and how to be a good person. And in, in a way that, that, that transcends irony and transcends criticism. Like you can't really make fun of either of them. It doesn't really make sense. It's like talking about Beethoven being entertaining or something. It just simply doesn't apply. So um, I don't know. I really can't add anything to okay, that. Okay, sorry. That's really no, good. Okay. So this no. is our Sunday nights. Too. Like Chris has all the good ideas, and no, I'm just not true. that's really great. I'm going to steal that no, somewhere. But uh, well, not to bury a lead here, but I did invite one other person um, to participate in this. And I'm, um, somebody who couldn't be here, but did write about the subject elsewhere. And I want to read what he wrote, and maybe you can divine who it is. Uh, it's another local. A person. Like millions of Americans, I grew up with peanuts, but I never outgrew it. Wherever I lived, wherever I traveled, I could find those three or four panels in the paper each morning. And Charlie Snoopy, it's weird to hear Charlie, it's always this Charlie Brown, right? Charlie, Snoopy, Linus, Lucy, Franklin, and the gang brought childhood rushing back. That's what made Charles Schultz so brilliant. He treated childhood with all the poignant and tender complexity it deserves. He gave voice to all its joys and anxieties. He explored the emotions that we too often forget kids feel until we're reminded that we once felt them ourselves. Hope, doubt, the exquisite pain of unrequited love, the self-exploration of what it means to be different, the comfortable knowledge that it's all going to be okay, even if Lucy's advice isn't very good. <laughs> For decades, Peanuts was our own daily security blanket. That's what makes it an American treasure. In his final strip, Schultz wondered how he could ever forget the Peanuts gang and the rest of us never will. And we can share our love for the gang with our children and our grandchildren for decades to come. Anyone know who, who wrote that? No? Good guess. <laughs> Barack Obama. Oh, that's right. Who had the yeah. audacity not to show up here tonight <laughs> despite the <laughs> invitation. I would say he'd, he'd be the third example of somebody how to be uh, uh, that's uh, what triggered yeah. it. That's yeah. The, yeah. And, and I mean, it's a surprise to a lot of people, and I don't know this for a fact, but I've been told that Schultz was, was a lifelong Republican, actually. This is true, um, yeah. and, that, and that he told Monty, uh, one of his sons, that one of his regrets was not voting for Kennedy in 1960. Hmm. Um, but he was friends with uh, Reagan. Reagan's favorite uh, part of Peanuts was, was Lucy pulling the, the football away. But... Uh, <laughs> Clinton and others, we're not going to talk about uh, presidential politics <laughs> any more than this. just said it all, though, <laughs> as a metaphor, pulling the football away, well, pulling our future away from America. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, whether it's, whether it's Lucy in the football or Linus in the, in the pumpkin patch, I mean, it, uh, people seem to be divided, whether it's a sh uh, manifestation of uh, ins an inspiring kind of resilience and perseverance and hope and faith or something very different. Do you have a view on that? Uh, I don't know. I mean, um, prob no. <laughs> I don't, I don't, um, I'm going to give that Maybe to Maybe he was Ivan just so. trying to figure it out himself, what faith was. You know, but there's some aspect of it that is, it's not rational, and uh, all the evidence is to the contrary, but People still had him. Maybe he was just trying to figure it out. I think the whole strip is him trying to figure himself out and his life out in some way. So, you know, I did mention this in the, in the essay too that Art Spiegelman said to me once that he felt that Schultz took himself, it broke himself into little pieces and then just let them go at each other for 50 years on the page. Basically, that's the example of like really what Peanuts is is the is Charles Schultz 
battling with himself on the newspaper page every single day, and every, you know, 300 million people read it or something. As, as to the matter of faith, actually, he was a devout um, member of the Church of God in, in Minneapolis, and then when he moved to California, there was no Church of God. Um, but he ended up then going to the Methodist Church. But then later in life, he, he sort of withdrew from that and became what he called a secular humanist. If not only, I think he kind of even questioned all of that stuff after. But he was still very generous and devout. He gave his, uh, his second house, did, bequeathed it to the church, and tithed tons and tons of money. I'm sure they were sad to see him go. So, um. I mean, in your piece, I mean, you wrote um, about Chris. You say he articulated quite eloquently the difference between drawing and drawing comics. Can you explain? Yeah, I mean, Chris, uh, you've talked about this. <laughs> really should let you answer it, but uh, I don't think I fully understood that, that. You know, the first time I might have read that in an interview or something where you said that, but until you actually draw and, and draw comics, you start to see what what the difference is. Um, and in Peanuts, um, I mean, a lot of it, uh, if you judge it as drawing, it, you, I mean, you have to use different criteria for how the drawing is used, because it's sort of a calligraphy. And uh, there are forms, and the characters sort of have a three-dimensional uh, three quality to them. But it, I mean, it's really kind of, in some ways, it is flat shapes. And the mystery of it, I don't know if anyone can explain it. Um, but to me, comics is kind of like alchemy more than science. Like I don't know how why those things come alive any more than I understand why it word uh, letters become words, be, you know, and then become even more complex words and concepts. It, comics operate that same way. I'm sure there's a scientist that can explain it better than I can. But I like to think of it as a sort of mysterious uh, kind of process, and that I mean the whole point of doing it is to surprise yourself when you're when you're doing it, I think. If you're not surprised by what you're creating in, in some way, whether it's pleasant or unpleasant surprise, uh, it's probably not gonna be that compelling a comic strip. Oh, shit. You know, but I, I don't know if you could break it down. And I don't, I don't even know if I want to. You know, I, I kind of like delving into it and not being able to fully understand it and just kind of going with it, I don't know. I don't understand breathing either. But. <laughs> Like, luckily, my body knows to do it, because if it were left up to me, I'd probably forget. <laughs> well, actually, uh, there's just a what, in coincidence with what uh, Ivan was saying here. Comics are the art that allows drawings to come alive on the page, in your mind. Like, if you look at this particular strip here, Peppermint Patty and Snoopy and Woodstock, they're drawings, but when you read them, they come alive. You go left to right. And if you notice, there's no words on this except for Schultz uh, signed it over to a friend of his. But if you read it, you'll hear sounds in your mind. And I, I come to think of that as what I uh, call the music of comics. And that music is that sort of strange internal rhythm that we all experience when we're meeting people or talking to them watching them move their hands away. I'm moving my hands right now and trying to decode if what they're saying is actually true or not. And I think Tolstoy was probably the writer who most effectively encoded that into his writing. He captured that rhythm of life into his actual prose. And I think Schultz, as a cartoonist, captured that electricity of actual movement in human life better than any other cartoonist. So. Well, Chris, you wrote, we don't just look at characters. We Re, quote unquote, read them like, what do you mean we read them like musical notes? Well, sort of like what I just said, they are like letters on a page. You use the same mechanisms of, of, of consciousness and apprehension in reading a comic strip that you do in reading a line of text. You look through the pictures, but you also read them at the same time. You're not looking at them, you're seeing them, but you're actually reading the pictures themselves. So I don't really know how else to articulate it. I haven't called it alchemy. I think that's appropriate, but it's, I, I, I'm not sure of much. But uh, having sat at a table for 30 years doing this, I can say with 99.9% .9 certainty that comics are an art of reading and reading pictures. You don't even need words in comics, but you're reading images. So. Did, did you bring the, the, the one with the, with the with the grown-ups in it? I did, yeah. Do you want me to show one? some of those? OK. So a lot of these pictures that I put together here are of Schultz's family and all those um, 
that very first picture there you saw was his um, was his was his dad's um, his dad's barber shop. His dad was a barber, and in the strip itself, you know, sometimes Charlie Brown talks about going to his dad's barber shop and how he feels like it's you know, the best place on earth. Again, a very biographical detail. This is actually the building that the barber shop was in, in the corner of Snelling, and I forgot the other. Uh, the other. Thank you. My goodness, there's a devotee here. I should you here? You should just come up and. <laughs> Um, this is a, a apartment building. His was, you can see the arrow pointing to it there, that far right apartment. That's where um, Schultz lived in high school, and his dad's barber shop was down I've, I've below. I've actually so. been in there. Oh, you went there. That's right. Yeah. I forgot. Yeah. Any, any... There's a brewery in the back now. There, it's uh, it's not the barber shop anymore. <laughs> so it's like a micro brew. Of place. course, everything is now. But yeah, they didn't let us in uh, to the upstairs or anything. But I, I was really curious to see um, the neighborhood he grew up in because it, it felt so much like the uh, neighborhood I grew up in here in Chicago after we, when my family moved here. Mm -hmm. um, it felt comfortable, like the, the sidewalk squares were the correct size for me and stuff like that. There, that I mean, that stuff, uh, even when he left uh, Minnesota, he was still drawing it. I don't know if he ever really drew California in the strip. I don't know, maybe... Yeah, I guess you could maybe consider a ranch house or something yeah. like that, California, but I think you're right. I think he was always stuck in the seasons, especially. Mm -hmm. Like, he always said he really liked the seasons. You know, I don't think it snowed a lot in Sebastopol, though. So he really reluctantly went to California. It was his first wife who really wanted to go out there. So, But his heart kind of remained in Minnesota, I think. And then she built this ice rink sort of Swiss looking ice rink, I think is a way of like making a little place where he could go and feel more Minnesotan mm -hmm. and even decorated it with sort of Scandinavian details and stuff. And then she ended up running off with the contractor. So um, <laughs> after the, yeah, and maybe is this being broadcast? It is, oh no. So um, anyway, <laughs> life is complicated. So, um, so this is a weird, uh, Schultz was always experimenting with the strips really early on in the 1950s. And and in a really bizarre sequence, I think in 1954, he did this five-week or four-week story of Lucy going and competing in a golf tournament, which is, I mean, you probably everybody felt this like, oh, what? You know, just sort of like, okay. And um, I mean, it's weird enough, like, but it, the weirdest part of it all is it's not a golf tournament with kids in it. It's a golf tournament with adults. And Schultz actually drew adults in these strips here. You can see in that second tier there where the dialogue balloon is pointing to Charlie Brown and, and Lucy, there's actual adults following them. And then the lower panel there, there's adults in the background. They don't have faces. Clearly, Schultz, when he actually started to draw this, we realized, like, oh my god, I've done something really that's not working here, but I'm going to try to see this through. Um, and I think it made him really aware of the fact that his strip was something very much stranger than he realized it was. The strip was designed by the syndicate, basically, to save space. They sold it as a space saver strip, which Schultz found particularly um, unnerving and angering because he felt he wanted to expand on the comics page. And he was given this tiny little space, and that's why it's called Peanuts. That's not his title. That was given by the syndicate, and he always felt it was very demeaning. But as he worked on the strip and tried to do these different things, he started to realize, I think, that the power in his strip was this sort of bizarre, strange little universe of just these little tiny kids acting like adults and somehow standing in for the, for the feelings that we have inside of us. And I've quoted this before. There's a, Vladimir Nabokov has said that we all have children buried alive inside of us. So I think that's kind of what he's getting at here. What I in do, the middle uh, tier, mm -hmm. that set, the left-hand panel, I mean, just looking at here, it looks so uh, Frank King. Oh, yeah, you're right. I, I mean, huh. just looking at that composition, I thought of Gasoline Alley, also Bruegel, but Gasoline Alley especially. And then the previous page in the center where they're, uh, they're really tiny silhouettes. Yeah. That's really strange. It the, is. The whole 50 years of Peanuts to see that view. He must have... Like you said, maybe he was, he was maybe looking at Milton Kniff or something. He just was like, oh, I got to try this new fangled way of yeah. whatevering, you know? So Is this the period where you said it was as if the strip had the flu? Yeah. Doesn't it feel like <laughs> it? You look at it, you're just like, ugh. You know, it's just like when you have a fever and you have the same thought going over in your mind or something. I so think Michael Jordan scored 37 with the flu, though. Right? <laughs> something. 
Well, still, you can see Schultz really had cartooning chops here. It's a beautifully composed page, but he could see, I think, that it didn't work, really. So here's some other weird stuff Schultz did. He did teenagers. He did this. He, he wasn't just doing peanuts when he started out. He did two other strips. Uh, this was for a, a Catholic youth magazine, um, which is kind of unlikely. He was drawing drawing uh, panel cartoons about teenagers for a Christian magazine. You know, it's like, wow, that's kind of an interesting combination. So, but just to see these particular, like right there, it looks like Charlie Brown and Peppermint Patty in art school and like age 21 or something, you know? And again, talk about having the flu. This is like taking mescaline or something, you know? Uh, but they're great jokes, but they have weirdly Christian punchlines to them too. So he was channeling something that was very personal to him and taking it very seriously. What also surprised me here is how loose they are. I mean, these are actually loose. like they're just really gesturally drawn very quickly, much more quickly drawn than even um, peanuts. I Strip think. at the time. Yeah, what year were, were those? Um, yeah, I think it's fifty-eight, maybe something. They, maybe they, around they there. do feel looser than the the peanuts strip at the like the strip got loose like that. But I think later, mm -hmm. maybe it was experimenting with his pen line or something. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, uh, could it be anything. Like he, maybe he was panicking. Like uh, you know, 1954. You, you don't know that the strip's going to last 50 years. I mean, you hope that you do, but maybe he was trying to diversify. Uh, I think you're going to show the other yeah. weird strip, and uh, maybe he was thinking, I got to have a backup plan here in case it's this possible. goes south. Who knows? I think at that point he was doing pretty well financially. He was making, I think, according to Michaelis, he was making twice the amount of the most highly paid college president at that time. But he still, I think this, I think a lot of this has to do with him feeling confined by the little tiny boxes of peanuts and not realizing that that was actually the catalyst, the chemical catalyst to make that atomic bomb happen every day on the page for him. So, but he really like this, this actually might have been inked by a guy named Jim Sassville, who was another uh, person at the art instruction um, company in Minneapolis where Schultz was employed and Schultz would do the loose drawing in pencil underneath and then Sassville would ink it. It's possible this is Schultz, but I'm not sure. It actually looks almost more like Hank Ketchum who did Dennis the Menace. But you can see this is like Schultz being sort of like a typical cartoonist and it helps you see the real weird power of peanuts. You know, it, it kind of brings it a little bit more into focus. And why he wanted to do a Sunday page about bridge and games and tennis, I, you know, it just seems like, okay, okay, right on, whatever. Needless to say, it didn't last, so. Just to interject, for all of the trajectory and changes, and you're on record as saying he, Schultz is the only writer you've been reading your entire life. Is that right? Yeah, I think, and I, probably everybody in this room could say the same thing. And I don't, you know, I don't read his early, his work and think, oh, what wonderful kid strips or something. I read it and I think, oh my God, you know, he's telling me something about life now in the same way I felt that when I was a kid. I get different things out of it now than when I was a kid, and I. I cannot think of any other writer who has as much power as a kid's writer or a teenager writer or as a adult writer. I mean, just uh, while we were talking, I just, this one strip came into my mind. I, I was coming to kind of go back to it. Um, it's the strip where uh, Charlie Brown is talking about that feeling when you're a kid, and it's kind of weird because he's talking about it nostalgically as if he's not a child, but... Um, when you're in the back seat of your parents' car and you, you can fall asleep. And then you get to a certain age and you can't do that anymore because you understand like, um, you know, your parents are human and might even be crazy or whatever. Uh, and then there's actually, it's kind of dangerous, you know, hurtling through <laughs> space and time with that car. But it's, it's so strange to me, like it's a child in the strip talking about something, this adult realization that um, probably everyone's had that moment in their life where they realize their parents were just human beings just trying to figure things out themselves. But when you're a kid, you don't think of it that way. You just, uh, you can fall asleep in the back seat. And it's there's like, something yeah. about like wanting to go back to that, you know, and it, it always... Um, stuck with me. I don't know. I was just for some reason thinking about that strip while we were talking. It's like, man, that's really good. I forgot about that. So, so this is another um, odd thing as we're moving up in time as these characters are getting older and older. Um, this turned up on the internet a few years ago and penciled up at the very top in the upper left-hand corner is the name Hagemeyer. 
And when I saw this, it was like, oh my God, what was he? My immediate thought was like, okay, he was going to experiment, and instead of peanuts, he was going to run this without telling anybody. You know, there was going to be 60-year-old or 50-year-old people in peanuts with no warning at all. I don't. These things never ran. I don't know exactly what they were intended for, but he actually drew them in the pre-printed peanuts um, squares. So I, you know, I don't know what he was thinking. The, the strip is actually named after a uh, fellow army uh, sergeant who befriended him uh, during the uh, Second World War and, and almost was sort of a big brother for him. But my friend Jeet here, who's a comics uh, writer and also writes for The Nation, documenting the collapse of our country right now, um, pointed out that, again, it's another strip with a domineering, bossy woman, which Schultz was both fascinated and kind of afraid of, I think. So, yeah, so I guess this is like Lucy, age 59 or something, after way too many donuts or something, so. That's such a Chris Ware idea, though, like it, to have a strip that's just going along and then all of a sudden it's, you know, 50 years later, but with no explanation. You kind of did that in your, in your book. Well, the weird thing is actually, I don't mean to interrupt. No, no, go ahead, yeah. As the Peanuts actually, when it was submitted to the syndicate, was a double-tiered strip. It was teenagers and children. And that was suggested by the syndicate, but then as they kind of messed with it on the page, they thought, oh, this doesn't work, it's kind of a mess. And they wiped out the teenager part and what was left were the kids. So, I mean, that's an interesting idea. You know, and Elsa Schultz actually tried that again a little bit later to submit a strip as a double-tiered thing, so, but... Well, speaking of trajectories, I've I've gone from wondering how are you guys having dinner every night, every Sunday night for 20 years, to understanding much more about why you guys get along so well after this conversation. There's a lot of simpatico and shared sensibility. Um, I know we have a lot more to get to. Maybe we can throw it open to some questions and you can incorporate some. I can. I have a couple of quick clips. Yeah, if great. you want, do you, does yeah. everybody want to leave here about like yeah. five minutes or so? Yeah. I won't show this. This is this just makes me laugh because it's a strip he wrote to a reader who told him to get rid of a character and it showed the anger of being a cartoonist and he drew the character with an ax in her head and said, okay, fine. You, you know, you're just going to have to have the death of a child on your mind for the rest of your life. So he definitely had an edge to him. So. I wanted to talk about Franklin because Franklin was admitted, it was in, 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 um, it created in 1968, shortly after the murder of uh, Martin Luther King uh, and uh, his response to letters from um, a uh, reader who suggested you need to have African American kids in the strip and Schultz included him. The syndicate told him it wasn't working. They were getting letters from people in the South saying they were going to cancel the strip, saying that they didn't want Franklin sitting next to Charlie Brown or Peppermint Patty, and certainly not playing on a beach. There were not integrated beaches at this time. And Schultz said, OK, if you take him out, I'm quitting. And Franklin stayed. So this is Schultz, 1963, and this starts out with the greatest bit. This is of narration ever, at least if you're a cartoonist. It's not going to play. You, Jesus Christ. Okay, hold on a second here. Let's see if we can make it work. And now he's alone. A one-man production team. Writer, humorist, social critic. An artist alone with his thoughts. You know, when you go on a comic strip, if you're going to wait for inspiration, you'll never make it. You have to become professional enough at this so that you can almost deliberately set down an idea at will. Most of the ideas I get merely sitting here at the drawing board, doodling on a piece of white paper, trying out little funny pictures, or starting arguments in my own mind between Charlie Brown and Lucy and Linus or the dog or something. I still enjoy drawing the comic strip as much now as I did when it first began. And I still would rather sit down and draw a good comic strip than do anything else when I have a good idea. And uh, it's perfectly possible for me to sit here in this room all by myself with an idea which I think is really funny and to sit here and laugh at it while I'm drawing. And sometimes when I have an idea which is really good, especially for a Sunday page, uh, I work myself up into such a nervous pitch that I can hardly letter the thing. I'm so anxious to get the thing down on paper. For Charles Schultz, his characters are practically as real and alive as his own children. There are three characters I enjoy working with the most, and those are Charlie Brown, 
Linus and Snoopy. I think Linus is the most fun to work with because uh, he is the most versatile. Linus has a certain innocence about him which makes him uh, easy to work with. I think he's the most appealing character of all. Now and then I do think of what these kids are going to be like as they grow up. And I think that Linus, for instance, will grow out of his problems. And eventually, if we think of him as growing older, will grow up and probably be the most successful person as a person of all of these children. I think Lucy would be the kind who will remain a fuss budget the rest of her life. And I think Charlie Brown will always be a Charlie Brown because the Charlie Browns just don't change. He has enough of this within him to keep him uh, tied down the rest of his life. I've never dreamed about the characters themselves, but I have, uh, I have thought sometimes lying awake at night just who in the world are these characters who have become so important and so real and so much a part of our lives? Just who in the world is Charlie Brown? Isn't it amazing just to watch him draw, just to see those things come alive on the page like that? That's from 1963. Um, this is Ivan's tribute to the end of Peanuts that he did in the New City newspaper way back in 1999. And I did one, too, because we were both so sad, really, that, you know. It's when he announced was, his retirement. Yeah, right and I don't know if anybody knows, but Schultz died the day after the very last Peanuts appeared. And that's after, if I may say, like a, basically a lifetime or a career of saying everything I have to say, I say through the strip and through right. the characters, and then in this karmic convergence that within 24 hours, yeah? Yeah. So this, just as a final thing here, um, of the audiovisual presentation part, he did a last interview in 1999 with Al Roker on, on 60 Minutes. And please play. It's not going to play. Let's try this again. Go back. OK. It didn't sink in until uh, I was a little kind of uh, song, friends, and all this sort of thing. And then uh, I, I wrote all this name, my, my name, said, uh, and I'll probably start crying. <laughs> to say to the, the folks who have read the read Peanuts for the last almost 50 years? It, it is amazing that they think that what I do was good. <laughs> I just, I just, the best I could. <laughs> Thank you for all the years. Thank you so very much. So anyway, he really meant it. Thank you for bringing that in. Thank you, really. So can we go to questions? Sure. Uh, it's curious. You said that he was a lifelong Republican. He obviously voted for Nixon. He wished he voted for Kennedy. It makes me wonder, I mean, that kind of throws my image of him into disarray. Would he be a Trump guy? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that's serious. I, you you know, know, I, I know that. I hate to bring that up, but were his scripts regressive that way, or were they? I always saw them as being so progressive. I think the problem here is is that we're you're taking it from the outside in. Schultz worked from the inside out, and that's what's happening to our country right now, and that's what's wrong with it. Is we're asking, are you a Republican first? Are you a Democrat first? And that's when we make our decisions, and that's wrong. And I think he and people at that time came from a different standpoint. So um, I think that's a big problem. That's what I would say. 
And I, I don't mean that as any judgment on you. That's just that's no, the way things are getting now to that point. You know, we're. I don't mean it as any. Uh, um, I hate to bring the Trump part in, but did his strip have any political meaning at all, or was it just? Uh, I mean, who you vote for does tell you something about your values. Mm -hmm. not, I mean. Or is his values not reflected in his strip? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, but I would like to assume that, like, you know, I'm a liberal Democrat, but I'm not going to assume that the other 50% of the country are all horrible human beings, you know? So it's like, I don't, but I don't, I mean, but I don't think it matters that much. I think that's part of the problem. So I don't know what he would say. I can't speak for him at all. Um, I know that my parents, who were used to be conservative, are now not. They're Democrats. And we now can talk about things I think we've never talked about before. So if there's one good thing about Trump, that's it. <laughs> yes. You mean of this trip? I mean, I know that Schultz wanted to call the strip Charlie Brown, or to call it good old Charlie Brown. Like, he was seen sort of as the center of the strip. And I think he always really kind of was. I think Schultz kind of toyed with different characters. Snoopy certainly kind of took over in the 60s and kind of suited the 60s, maybe, you know, culture and mindset or something a little bit more. And I think in the last couple of panels, some people have suggested that Snoopy was really like the the one non-sad non character, actually. So I don't know what you think, but. Well, right, I, I mean, I think it was always his stand-in, but then he would go through periods of kind of trying to figure out the other characters, which I suppose is his way of examining other parts of his personality. And maybe at certain times, he felt more like the Snoopy part of himself, or, or rerun, uh, was the character toward the end of the strip that he seemed to invest a lot into. And I mean, Freerun became a cartoonist. An underground An underground cartoonist, cartoonist yeah. specifically. <laughs> so, I don't know. I wish he'd sent me his zine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hey, cartoonist, um, I was just curious, it's not what, who or what inspired you to become a cartoonist? Like, was it just general artists and then just switched to cartooning? Or Charles Schultz inspired me to become a cartoonist. Yeah, I mean, uh, the first comics I saw were all Disney comics when I was growing up in Italy. Um, so I guess that probably was the, that's what I was copying all the time. But I wasn't as emotionally invested in a, a comic until Peanuts. That was like another level to it. So um, I, yeah, still a number one influence for me. Yeah. I mean, like I said in the essay, I used to read the paperbacks in my grandparents' basement. I just, you know, they were real. Like, I, like this, I picked this panel for a reason here because it's just that's what I wanted to try to get on the page, you know, to try to have that friend on the page in some way. So, Does anyone choose to be a cartoonist? I think it, it, cartooning cho chooses you. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I can't, I just can't picture myself with a beret and a smock. <laughs> you know, like I, I, I love seeing his uh, drawing table and his tools. That's I, I, I love that uh, aspect of it. It's such a kind of working class uh, art form. It's unpretentious. It's humble. You don't need anything fancy to make a cartoon. Yeah, his studio too. There was like a there was a mark on the back of the wall, and I was like, what is that? It's like this this scrape, and I realized it was him leaning his chair back for 30 or so many years, however long he was there. And on the drawing board, too, where he had worked, was just the, all the varnish 